Welcome, both here and online, to our last session of the economic series and our very final last session at all for the Shifting Landscape series. Um, it's been a long haul, seven months, um, and it's been wonderful. I hope and hope for all of you. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, I do want to extend our apologies uh, for last week that we could not hold our session. Our speaker, as you know, um, by now she was very sick or wretched was her word. And she has since revived and hoped that perhaps sometimes she can join us for um, a conversation at least. Before we get into tonight, I wanna to remind everyone um, this is made possible by generous funding um, by a number of organizations and individuals, generous funding and work. <laughs> uh, first are the Michigan Humanities and the Michigan Council for the Arts and Cultural Affairs. It's been a team production, Kathy Organ here, Thomas Trahey at the back in the technology, Kathy Calabretta online, and Mike McKinney, Matt Sanderson, and I were also team members. I want to thank Eric Smith, the director of the library here in town for his support, administrative, moral, and financial. He has provided um, just uh, outstanding um, support for the whole series. Sue Carlson, who's also here tonight um, and has been here every night. She, is a, a she has been writing all of the press releases, so we thank her. And Lisa Danes, who has been keeping our website up to date. If for mind and body, uh, we have decaf coffee in the back, peanut brittle and cookies for tonight. And I just wanted to shout out to my brother who has been the chef for almost all of these. I think only one night did I um, say I, I, I could do them myself. I just didn't have time on Mondays. And he's been um, perfect because everyone has loved his treats. So thank you, Brett Portman. Um, and those at home, I hope you have dinner or treats or a beverage of some sort. Two tech notes, we probably don't need this anymore, we were thinking last week, but um, we still wanted to make it in case we would cause a fluke, which is to say that um, we may lose connection here in this building. You will not online. Online, you will always see the speaker and hear the speaker, and uh, all of that will still be working. It's just that we will lose connection here in, in this place. And then when Thomas comes back on, he will tell the speaker that we were not able to be with you for the last 20 to 30 seconds and ask to have um, a recap of what transpired. Also questions, um, I will read the chat questions and any questions from the audience will be mic'd. So welcome to tonight's final session. I have to say um, to tell a little bit of story about myself as I was thinking about my intro to this the last night. I got myself in quite a tizzy about, but Brock, there is no outcome. There is no product. There's no program that you guys are doing. There's nothing that the audience has decided that is really important. Da, 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 product, product, product. Well, thank heavens, my better self clued in, clued me in and said, that was not our goal to us. Our goal was to look at the rubble beneath our feet. And there was a lot of it. And it, there still is after the past two years. What we wanted to do was to provide information and ideas, new ideas or new sources for new ideas that many of you have that would help you continue on with the research and, and gathering information in areas that you wanted to do. Some of those might be part of the topics that we have gone over th through this series, but some and many won't be. We only did six different issues so that you would have some more skills, more information than when you began this series. And so that you could take that and do what you want to improve what you care about in the world. That's really the sum of what we wanted to have happen here, to be all of us to get smarter and more creative and more energetic. So thank you for participating. Um, uh, glad we're, we hope some of our topics have really perked your interest and um, just your creativity. So it's been wonderful and incredible. So, um, and before I end this part of it, there is one other gift. I was reading some poetry last night, like many um, this past couple of weeks has been full of sleepless nights and we don't know why. And it's a kind of a roller coaster. You're fine one moment and then not another. So anyway, I went and picked up a book in my, in my, on my shelves. And there was this post-it note 
taken the, uh, something I had found in another book, and I don't know why I put it in this particular poetry book, but I did. And this, I thought, this is perfect for saying thank you to all of you and what we're all been all about here. There is not one of us that has not needed at one time or another to take the scraps of our lives and find a way to build something more out of them than we have. Though gems or scraps are in the rubble piled all around us over the past two years, find the piles that excite you and build something more out of them than you have. Our topic tonight is part two of a two session topic on the work of government. Since part one was to take place last week, but our speaker was ill, I want to just give a, a little brief summary of what Amy Lerman was going to talk about. These topics are freestanding, but still there is a connection. The original meaning of good for government work, which is the title of Amy, one of Amy's books, is not, does not mean what we mostly today think it means. Most of us think it's a sarcastic way of talking. What we're really saying is government work is pretty darn mediocre or shoddy. The, eclect the electric words in newspapers, et cetera, is that government is inefficient, ineffective, and costly. But the negativity was not in its original meaning. If your work had been accepted by the government in a contract or what, for some, some project or one another, that meant your work was excellent. It was high praise indeed. And you could profit greatly after you finished your contract with the government by, be, by speaking that you had worked for the government. Government, in fact, was supported most of the 20th century with praise from both parties. But it lost this good meaning um, in what Lerman calls and, and remains lost because of the lie that government isn't any good or that most of the work by government isn't any good or work by government, if it's good, is a fluke. And she says that badgering or bashing imperils everyone because it engenders mistrust, but it's not only a mistrust in the government, she believes it bleeds into every other aspect of our lives, business, education, even religion, everything where other human beings work and live and thrive. Lastly, she also thinks that, she also understands that government isn't perfect, and she, but she deals with the fact that government's gotta come clean about that. It's gotta function and treat itself just like any other business does, which tells us when it has done wrong and what it's going to do to make up for it, or it doesn't exist anymore. So government needs to know how to go out ahead of the problems that it might create and own them and then move so that it needs to prove that it too can improve and sustain credibility. Part two tonight are old ideas in new times. So yes, it's the old idea that from the, from the 20th century that government work is good work. And we're going to get concrete evidence from America's history in that time of the 20th century our um, speaker tonight, Paul Pearson, and his co-author, Jacob Hacker, are going to provide historical excellence to, from the government during the years and the preparation years before the American World War II and in the years following World War II. And they believe that this can show us the way forward in the 21st century for, for once again, America being full of prosperity for all or for more than it has been and leadership in the world. There is something from, um, sorry, from um, the speakers tonight that they believe, or the, from the speaker tonight that he and his co-author believe Americas have forgotten. Indeed, they say we exhibit amnesia. I now want to introduce to you our speaker tonight, political science professor Paul Pearson. Good evening, Paul, and welcome. Oh, hi. Good to be here. Good. I want to give you briefly his, his background, 
Paul has a BA from Oberlin College. Yay, Ohio, once again, right, folks? We've got folks here that are from Ohio and online. Woo! And he has an MA and a Master's of Philosophy and a PhD all in political science from Yale University. He is currently John Gross Professor of Political Science at the UC Berkeley. Paul's first book in 1994 won a prize from the American Political Science Association. He won the award for best work on American national politics. Since then, he has written and edited more than 10 books, including two with Jacob Hacker. Their book, Winner Take, All, Winner Take All Politics, published in 2010, became a New York Times sell bestseller. An American Amnesia, How the War on Government Led Us to Forget What Made America Prosper, published in 2019, 2016, will be his focus tonight. Please help me welcome Paul Pearson. <laughs> kind introduction. introduction. Great to be with you guys, um, even from a distance. Um, I also wanted to start with just a couple of other uh, thanks. Um, I guess indirectly, I'd like to thank everyone who Brooke thanked for making this series possible. And I know um, there's an awful lot that goes on beyond, beyond the, behind the curtain uh, to make uh, these kind of uh, tech events uh, come off. So, so thanks to everybody involved. Um, I want to thank actually Amy Lehrman, uh, who is um, a colleague of mine here at Berkeley. I'm sorry you guys didn't get a chance uh, to hear her talk last week because uh, she's really um, she's really amazing, and I, I'm sure you would have found it really interesting. Um, and it would have dovetailed, I think, really nicely with what I'm going to talk about tonight. And and lastly, I want to thank Jacob um, Hacker, who uh, was the co-author of this. Um, of the book that I'm going to be uh, speaking about, um, and actually we've written three other books together now. So he's my longtime uh, partner in crime and trying to uh, trying to work through some of these challenging issues. Um, I'm gonna. I was told by Brooke that I could talk for an hour. I'm going to try to keep it shorter than that because I I do want to um, leave as much time as possible for us to actually have a conversation uh, about about these issues. And I'm also, um, I'm a political scientist, but I'm gonna talk a fair amount about uh, history and economics as, as Brooke uh, implied, um, and mostly circle back to the politics at the end. Um, uh, these days it actually is kind of a relief not to talk uh, as much about politics as I, as I usually do. Uh, maybe, maybe also a relief not to talk as much about the present um, as, as I usually do, but to talk as a, a bit about where we've been. Um, but I promise we'll circle back to that and I'll, I'll say a little bit about how I think our current politics uh, has contributed to what we call American amnesia and um, what, where we might look for, um, so, for some more promising steps uh, forward. Uh, but uh, but let, me, let me back up before I do that. Let's see if I can uh, succeed in sharing uh, my PowerPoint so you can see these slides. Um, okay, that seems like it's probably working. All right, so, so here's the, the title of this book, um, American Amnesia. Uh, and, uh, and, and the book was really written to try to help, um, help readers think about how we could recapture, as Brooke was saying, kind of an old idea. Um, and it's not an idea just about government, but it's an idea about how government and the private sector uh, could fit together uh, to form uh, what's often called a mixed economy. Uh, these days, people talk a lot about um, socialism as if every time you get have the government involved, that's socialism, uh, but, but um, all of the world's prosperous economies are mixed economies, uh, that is, they involve a robust role for the private sector, but also a robust role for the public sector. And so when we shift into that language of socialism, I think we're really losing track of the way that this system is actually operated, not just in the United States, uh, but abroad uh, as well. Uh, and how in, in the American case, how it, that mixed economy system uh, really did lead America to prosper. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to sketch that idea out in some more detail in the next um, uh, 30 or 40 minutes or so. Uh, when I talk about these issues with my students at Cal, uh, 
Uh, I often start by reminding them of this landmark on our campus. It's called the Campanile. It's a tall needle-like structure with, uh, with bells that chime at the top. Um, it's the, 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 um, the site on the campus that you can see from the greatest distance. And most Cal students don't know, or at least when I ask them, they seem not to know, um, that at the base of the Campanile, there's a, there's a bust of, um, of Abraham Lincoln. And when I ask them about that bust, um, usually what, and I say like, well, why is there a bust of Abraham Lincoln uh, at, the, at the base of the Campanile? And, and usually what people will say is, well, you know, the, the Emancipation Proclamation, um, you know, he held, held the union together and so on. Um, but that's actually not the reason why there, there's a bust of Lincoln. There's a bust of Lincoln because while he was president, he signed a piece of legislation that was called the Merrill Land Grant Act uh, that said that the federal government would allocate land free of charge uh, to states who set up uh, public universities on, on that land. And at that point, the land was was the really costly thing. That was what you wanted. And so um, the Merrill Land Grant Act had a huge effect in spreading uh, public universities across the country, uh, not, not just Cal, which is a, a land grant institution, but um, Cornell University, MIT, uh, the University of Wisconsin, the University of Minnesota, the list goes on and on. Um, extraordinary uh, public institutions uh, that, were, that were created by, uh, by the efforts of, of of the US government, the federal government. And one of the things that we explore in the book is that, that for the United States in the 19th century, this was not unusual. The way uh, the government tended to try to get things done was by using land. The federal government had a lot of land. Uh, it didn't have a lot of tax revenue. And so when it was something done, like, a, like the building of, an, of a transcontinental uh, railroad, uh, the way that it did it was by make, making land grants and the same thing uh, with, um, with cr creating uh, these, these remarkable public, uh, public universities. Um, and it turns out, I'll say a little bit more about this in a minute, that when economists now think about how the US became wealthy and indeed how all wealthy countries except maybe a handful who rely on, on oil wealth uh, and, and don't have much else, Else, the way that the countries have become wealthy is um, partly through investments of capital, uh, partly through uh, the very hard and um, talented labor of individuals. Uh, but if you just put the, the inputs of labor and capital together, it, it comes up way short of the kind of extraordinary growth that the US and other countries have experienced over the last century and a half, uh, that the key driver economists have found uh, is science and technology. Right, it's, it's developments in our know-how which, um, which allow us to do a lot more out of um, the inputs of capital and labor that we make. So without science and technology, you don't get prosperity. Uh, and it turns out that without a robust public sector, you don't get uh, those kinds of gains in, in science and technology. I'll say a little bit more about that in, in a few minutes. Um, let's come back to the cover of the book for a second. American amnesia, seeing the role of government hazily uh, through the clouds or the fog. Um, we always liked uh, the cover of this book, though Jacob discovered at a certain point uh, that the photograph that this was based on, uh, it was actually, they, they slightly photoshopped and lightened out um, the original photograph in order to get this kind of misty uh, effect, uh, that the orig original picture looked more like this and it looked like that because um, into, I think, the, the mid to late 1970s, there was a, a, a coal-powered uh, utility plant very close to the Capitol building, uh, which created a pretty filthy air that they had to kind of white out in order to make the, the cover for our book. Um, sign of uh, one of the challenges that the US faced uh, in the 1960s and 1970s uh, you can go back further. I could show you a lot of pictures that look like this. This is um, Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1944, uh, but you can see pretty horrific pictures uh, from Los Angeles, uh, from St. Louis, uh, from cities all over the country uh, 
um, that reflect the kind of air quality that existed um, in the 1940s and, and 1950s. Um, that changed in the US um, with the coming of the Clean Air Act uh, in uh, 1970. And um, recent estimates uh, have suggested that the Clean Air Act um, increased life expectancy in uh, polluted cities across the United States. These are the, um, uh, the cities that saw the, the biggest gains in life expectancy. And amazingly, Weirton, West Virginia, five extra years of life expectancy as a result of the Clean Air Act and the removal of, of particulate uh, pollution from that. I, I like this slide because, um, uh, because Wichita, Kansas here is, is number two on this list. Wichita, Kansas, the home of um, David and Charles Koch, the Koch brothers uh, who grew up there, sons of Wichita, um, who have devoted uh, a great deal of their fortune uh, and, uh, and, and a significant part of their adult lives. Um, uh, David's passed away now, Charles Koch still going strong, um, but to fighting things like the EPA. But, uh, you know, it'd be nice to remind them that in fact, um, they uh, were able to breathe much clean, cleaner air in Wichita, uh, Kansas, because of the contributions of, of uh, the Environmental Protection Agency and the Clean Act, Air Act. Um, and this is just one example. I'm going to give you many examples of uh, ways in which government or the mixed economy, uh, the con combined role of the private sector and the public sector, really have produced extraordinary prosperity in the US over, um, over a period stretching back at least a century now. Uh, and in the first part of the talk, I wanna make a two basic points uh, related to the, the, the general theme that I'm, that I'm exploring tonight. Uh, the, the first is just to say the 20th century was in terms of its improvement in the quality of life of ordinary Americans was quite extraordinary. Uh, and I, I think to a degree that we, that we don't always fully appreciate. You know, I think we have a tendency to dwell on the bad news. Uh, and of course, there are lots of grim episodes um, in, um, in the 20th century American history, whether you're talking about the Great Depression or World War II uh, or Jim Crow, you know, the list could, could go on. Uh, but in terms of the, the average quality of life in the country, it was an, it was an extraordinary century. And, the, and so I want to say a little bit about that. And then the second point is to explore how that would not have been possible without a robust role for government. Right. So, the, so those are the two points. So let me, let me run through them uh, in, the, in the next few minutes. Um, so we can start with life expectancy. And here I'm going to include some data uh, for the UK, since you, this allows you to go back uh, much further historically than you'd be able to do just with the US. Uh, so the first part of this data is the UK, and then it turns to the US. Um, the UK would also see a, a big increase in, in life expectancy following uh, the Industrial Revolution, be, you know, beginning in the, the, the latter part of the 19th century, but through the 20th century. But, but really quite extraordinary to, to think that around the turn of the century, life expectancy in the US was around 40. Uh, and by the end of the 20th century, um, it was more, it was uh, approaching 75. Um, just probably no other single statistic gives you a clearer sense of the kind of improvement that we're talking about in quality of life than just the fact uh, that people uh, were living much longer lives at the end of this period than they were at the beginning. Um, and not just longer lives, but probably, but much healthier for, for the um, uh, for the duration of the time that they were that they were on the planet. So life expectancy is a, probably the single uh, best marker of prosperity, but it's not the only one. Uh, you can look at income, uh, and again, looking at the UK and the US. Um, I hope you guys can see that. I um, uh, the the right hand side of this is cut off on on my screen, uh, but um, you know huge increase in income growth that really doesn't begin until um, uh, the second half of the 19th century and then accelerates in the 20th century. Uh, and then finally, education. Um, we're looking here at the year that somebody was born in the U.S. Uh, and how much uh, schooling on average they would receive, and you can see the remarkable change that takes place between 1880 
and 1940. Uh, if, you were, uh, if you were born in 1940, the chances were pretty good that you were gonna see some amount of education post high school. Uh, if you were born in 1880, it was extremely unlikely that that was going to be the case. Uh, and so again, a, a really remarkable improvement that takes place over this period continues to improve for cohorts born after 1940, but at a much slower rate, which is something I'm gonna come back to a little uh, later, um, later in the talk. Uh, there are many ways in which the remarkable transformation that I'm talking about begins to lose steam as you get closer to the present, you know, you know which is um, this talk is full of a bunch of good news and some bad news. Uh, and that would be one of the slowing down is one of the bad news parts of the story. Um, so how did all this happen? Uh, the argument that I want to make uh, in, the, in much of the rest of the talk is to say the role of government is really critical in all of this. Uh, and we suggest in the book and we explore some of the history uh, that throughout much of American political history, it was widely recognized that you need an effective government. Uh, in order to um, produce uh, a prosperous society. Um, and one, I think, just easy way to get into this at the beginning um, is, uh, is to remind people of early American political history, the origins of the Constitution. Uh, and often when people hear that story, uh, think about the Constitution, and I find this with my own students, that their version of American political history kind of goes, well, there was a, uh, the Declaration of Independence and then the War for Independence uh, and then yada, 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 uh, and then you had a constitution. Uh, but the, the actual story, probably most of you know this, right, that uh, is that in between uh, the Declaration of Independence and uh, the Constitution, there was something called the Articles of Confederation, um, which was, I think it's fair to say, a failed constitution. It was a highly decentralized system with very weak government. Uh, and um, by the mid 1780s, the people we think of as the founders, Madison, Hamilton, Washington, and so on, all the, all the folks who gathered in Philadelphia uh, had recognized that they needed um, much stronger political authority and actually to have in order to have um, the, the society be able to prosper, indeed, even to have it survive. There was great concern uh, uh, as the Articles of Confederation was sort of, was sort of collapsing, um, that the US would simply be gobbled up by the um, powerful countries that still uh, were interested in trying to control, control the fledgling United States. But we've forgotten this story over time. So here's a nice example of American amnesia where you can see, um, uh, this is a, a measuring uh, in English language books, how often they mention the Declaration of Independence and how often they mention the Articles of Confederation. And you can see back in the 19th century, people, people remember the Articles of Confederation a lot, uh, but it's now been almost, almost completely forgotten. Um, and um, I think in that sense, we are really uh, misremembering our own history and losing sight of something that, as I said, the founders uh, new. So here's um, uh, Alexander Hamilton. Um, all right, not Alexander Hamilton, but the quote is from Alexander Hamilton, in which he basically reminds us, as he's arguing for a more robust federal government, um, that it was natural that we had sort of rebelled against government in, in creating the Articles of Confederation, uh, but that we also needed um, a government that was capable um, and that could be vigorous in its operations. And the actual constitution that was adopted uh, was very much as one historian has written, it was a revolution in favor of government, the writing of the constitution. Uh, they wanted a robust government, um, of course, one in which checks and balances would operate uh, and liberties would be protected, but also one that would be capable of action. So um, this has turned out to be uh, something that has been of vital importance uh, throughout all of um, American uh, political history. Uh, so if you, um, uh, one way to see this is uh, Thomas Jefferson, another important uh, voice in the forming of the country. 
And here he's pointing to an example, Jefferson, very interested in science. That was one of the big reasons why he instigated Lewis and Clark's investigation of the West. Um, and he, here he notes in this interesting passage uh, that if you receive an idea from me, if you receive instruction, um, you can receive that idea without it taking anything away from me. And, and, and he gives us his, his an example that somebody who lights their candle at his um, receives light without darkening me, right? It doesn't do any harm to my candle to light your candle as well. And Jefferson was pointing out here a, a characteristic of knowledge, right? That knowledge is something that can be spread without being lost. It doesn't have to be sacrificed to be spread. And this becomes part of the justification for why you want government to play an important role in um, supporting, supporting knowledge and, and the dissemination of knowledge. Um, here's, um, I think, an, a slide that captures this very well, scientific Nobel Prizes. Um, and you can see um, uh, the US emerging over time as being, as replacing uh, the UK and Germany as the dominant scientific power uh, in the world. Um, in some ways, you know, this is a, a slightly a lagging indicator because it's when the scientists receive the Nobel Prize. So the change is probably taking place a little bit earlier, right, in terms of when people are making those discoveries, when they're getting the scientific training that allows them to make that, that, uh, those discoveries. So the big change is probably taking place here between the 1920s and the 1950s, uh, when the, the U.S. emerges partly with its extraordinary system of higher education as um, the dominant scientific power um, in the world. And as I've already suggested, that has a lot to do with American prosperity. Let me give you some other examples. What are we looking at here? We're looking at um, the Harvard Business School graduating class of, I forget what year, I'm gonna say 19, 24, something like that. And you may notice there's not a lot of diversity in this picture. Uh, I mean, I, you have some diversity with respect to facial hair, um, but that's about it. Uh, and economists now recognize um, that limiting educational opportunities uh, to a small fraction of the total population of the country is really to shoot yourself in the foot in terms of uh, economic and social development. You're leaving um, huge, uh, a huge array of talent um, not having the opportunity to really shine um, because the, do the doors to that kind of educational attainment and um, positioning yourself in the, the most powerful, the most influential positions in society is being cut off from, uh, from women, uh, from people of color, uh, and, and so on. And the, the economic price you pay for that is is very high. So the opening of the doors to elite positions to a wider range of Americans and to immigrants as well um, has been an additional really important source of economic prosperity. And this wouldn't have happened uh, without government. Um, I went digging uh, for a slide today from a recent study, which I thought kind of echoes this point and I think also is a reminder of how far we still have to go. Um, this is um, uh, data on um, the share of the student body at different uh, US institution, uh, uh, higher educational institutions. The share that comes from the top 1% that is families that make at least $650,000 a year. And the share that comes from the bottom 60% of the population families making less than $65,000 um, a year. Um, and there are many leading institutions in the United States, something like 37, I think, on this list, where a greater share of the student body comes from the top 1% uh, than comes uh, from the bottom um, 60%. Really quite striking. Uh, Washington University in St. Louis, great university, um, but uh, ranks number one in terms of uh, the share that's coming from the, the top 1% of the income distribution. Um, I stuck Michigan and Berkeley on here, was actually surprised to see um, that Michigan actually, with respect to the, the distribution of its, of its student body by class, um, by economic class, looks more like Harvard and Princeton than it does like Berkeley. Um, 
I spent the first half of my teaching career at Harvard. I spent the second half at Berkeley. And I have to say that one of the things that I have really loved about being at Berkeley is how often I'm meeting with a student and they tell me that they are the first person in their family to go to college. Um, that did not happen to me very much at Harvard. Um, it happens at Berkeley um, all the time. Um, and so that's a way in which a public institution, again, the role of government, um, is opening doors for talented individuals um, to make the most, to make the most of their talents. Okay, so expanding educational opportunity is one of the biggest contributions uh, the government has made um, to prosperity. Uh, here's another one. Um, uh, this is uh, tobacco consumption in the US. Uh, and you can, this is, you know, a number of, of cigarettes per capita smoked every year. Uh, and you can see it peaks in the early 1960s uh, as um, scientific evidence mounts that uh, smoking is hazardous and as both federal and state government um, start to weigh in um, to try to discourage people from smoking uh, with various kinds of nudges, economists sometimes uh, call them um, uh, uh, eliminating broadcast uh, ads uh, for cigarettes, increasing taxes um, on, um, on cigarettes, uh, the, the famous Surgeon General report. And you can see as time goes on with these various kinds of interventions to discourage smoking, um, uh, smoking declines. And the public health uh, benefits of this change rival those of the Clean Air Act. Something like one and a half to two years of added life expectancy uh, by um, uh, 2015 or so, it was estimated that these efforts to uh, discourage people from smoking had prevented something like 8 million, 8 million premature deaths uh, in the United States that, that would have been um, uh, associated with tobacco consumption. So that is just a huge, huge gain for prosperity. It's not, not just about increasing people's income. It's about increasing their quality of life. And again, it's hard to imagine that this would have happened the same way uh, without uh, a series of government efforts to, to discourage people, not to prevent people from smoking, but to just discourage them from smoking. And here's uh, another example. I think um, an example that probably will resonate uh, from uh, people living in, in um, uh, Michigan. Uh, so lead poisoning. Uh, lead poisoning is a destroyer of lives, a, a quiet hidden destroyer of lives. Uh, you, you all know about this because of the experience in, in Flint, Michigan a few years back. Uh, in, in Flint, Michigan, about 5% of kids uh, had measured a, a blood level uh, of lead above five uh, micrograms per deciliter. Um, that's really bad. Five micrograms is really bad. If you, if you take a kid from, from one microgram to four micrograms, uh, you're probably on average gonna cost them about 3.5 points of, of IQ. Um, so you get above five and you're really doing serious cognitive damage uh, to kids. Um, and scandalous as, as what happened in Flint was, um, in the late 1970s, 90% of US kids had blood lead levels of 10 uh, micrograms or higher, 90% of US kids. And that's because there had been um, lead in um, paint, especially a problem in urban areas where there are a lot of older buildings with lead paint um, and there is lead in gasoline. Uh, and so, with those factors, you can see that average uh, measured lead levels in blood went way up. Uh, but beginning in the 1970s, the federal government begins to, to intervene. Um, the EPA mandates a phase out of leaded gasoline. Uh, the Consumer Product Safety Commission bans residential lead paint. Um, and um, eventually over time, you see um, massive declines in lead poisoning. I think fair to call this lead poisoning in the US. 90% uh, of US kids had that 
10% or higher level of lead uh, in the late 1970s, now less than 1% do. Uh, the rates are still way too high. Uh, and um, even under, under the watered down infrastructure bill that I'm gonna talk about in a bit, you can see um, that uh, there's money in there to further reduce the amount of exposure to lead there is, but the gains since the 1970s have really been spectacular. Again, um, a huge uh, improvement um, in prosperity, huge gain in prosperity. So the book is, is full of stories like this. Uh, one of my favorite reviews des described us as having provided a Mount Everest of evidence about the role of government in uh, fueling prosperity. Um, again, joined with uh, the private sector, right? The point that we're making is not that the public sector should always uh, replace the private sector, not at all. Uh, the way one of my professors at, at Yale described it was uh, markets, markets are extremely valuable and government is extremely value, valuable. Markets mm -hmm. are like fingers. Um, they're deft, they're flexible. Um, you can, you can um, mold things around them. Um, but government is like a thumb. Um, government can use the power that it has, the power to tell people what they have to do, what they can't do, the, the power to raise taxes. Um, and all of these things allow you to do a lot of things that the private sector is not going to be able to do. Uh, the private sector focuses on um, maximizing the benefits from a private transaction between a buyer and a seller. Um, but if those transactions don't take into account pollution or lead poisoning or the benefits that flow from having a more educated population, uh, they're not going to be provided uh, at, at, the, at sufficient levels um, or the optimal levels uh, by the private sector. So you need, you need a mixture. You need both fingers and a thumb. Right, in order to have the most powerful effects. And this is the system that the United States discovered um, over the course of, um, mostly over the course of the 20th century. But we don't hear uh, much about that these days. We don't hear, uh, and of course the newspapers are not very, it doesn't make for a very great headline to say, uh, things are getting better very slowly because of government, right? That's not a, not a sexy headline. Um, but the overall record over the course of most of the 20th century is really quite, quite remarkable. Um, okay, so that's the good news. Um, but now uh, we have to turn to some bad news. Uh, I, this slide is probably a little hard uh, to, to decipher, but I think it's actually quite telling because it puts the US uh, in comparative perspective. And what we're looking at is um, how educational opportunity and achievement have changed over time in different countries. And the blue squares mark um, essentially the educational attainment of somebody who on average, who was 55 to 64 um, in the year 2012. Uh, and the black triangles mark the same level of attainment uh, for people um, who are 25 to 34 in that, in that year. Right, so, um, so what you'd really like to see, if you wanna see your country doing well, this is the percentage of people of that age um, who have had some education past high school. So what you'd like to see is um, to be up near the top of this chart, right? To be up closer to 70%. Um, and it would probably be a good sign for how your country was doing um, if that triangle was quite a ways above the square, right? That is, you're doing a lot better for 25 to 34 year olds um, than uh, was true for 55 to 64 year olds uh, who you know, reached the age of, of kind of maxing out on education uh, three or four or five decades earlier, right? Um, and you can see, so a, a real success story here, I would say is South Korea, right? Which was pretty much at the bottom um, 40 years ago, but is now at the top of this list. Uh, but you can see pretty robust gains in all of these countries. In fact, there are only a couple that don't display that. Um, one is Germany and the other is the United States. Um, so the US was way ahead of most countries uh, a generation or two ago, um, but it has made almost no progress in spreading 
educational attainment in the, in the last generation or so. Uh, and that's a pretty common story as, as we look across a bunch of edu indicators. Um, here is um, health expenditure and life expectancy over time. And what you'd really like to do on this chart is to be kind of zooming up the left side here um, with your life expectancy going up, uh, but without having to spend too much more on healthcare. Um, what you don't want to do is to be taking a sharp turn to the right, right, where you're spending more and more money over time, um, but you're not seeing much in the way of improvements in life expectancy. Um, and that's the U.S. The U.S. looks like, you know, I don't know, the, the driver who doesn't have GPS in their car um, and has just really taken a wrong turn here. Um, and we're off there all by ourselves uh, in um, uh, having a much less impressive performance. Life expectancy is still going up, so that's good news. Um, but we're spending a lot more on health care and our life expectancy is lagging now behind that of um, this whole set of other uh, prosperous countries and a bunch of countries like Chile that are, you know, that we think of as being sort of middle income countries, not even particularly wealthy countries, but they get, they produce a much higher uh, level of life, life expectancy than the US. Um, you can see this more indications, just to get a slightly different way to see this visually uh, compared with other countries, you, which you can see over time, they continue to have their life expectancy increase uh, in the US, both for men and for women um, have been falling behind. This is the, the probability of people reaching um, at least the age of 50. Um, here's one final slide about this, quite depressing, um, uh, uh, that shows uh, mortality rates for people right around being 50 years old uh, and in most countries, and actually for groups like Hispanics in the US, you can see that those numbers uh, have been going down in the last quarter century. Uh, but in the US for whites, um, age 45 to 54, this is not true. Um, actually, if anything, uh, mortality rates have gone up a little bit. And this is being driven by what um, the Princeton econ economist um, Angus Deacon and uh, Anne, I'm blanking on her last name, I apologize for that, um, uh, have called deaths of despair, deaths of despair. Um, drug uh, overdoses, um, deaths from alcohol, um, smoking, um, uh, suicides, and so on. Um, so again, the US no longer at the cutting edge in generating prosperity for its citizens. Um, and even where we look best, which is, um, are we providing people uh, a good economic standard of living? The U.S. Looks, still looks pretty good in comparative uh, perspective, but not as good as it did 40 years ago. Lots of other countries uh, catching up. And for, for many with kind of middle class incomes in the U.S., those incomes have been, have been basically stagnating over the last uh, 20 years or so, which has not been true in other countries. So... Um, uh, the U.S. is not as successful in generating prosperity as it was a generation or two again. One final slide about this, um, thinking about the U.S. pandemic response. Um, and here I'm using measures that are based, which I think uh, actually to me are maybe the best way to think about this because it's so hard, especially cross-nationally, to compare countries and to have similar data um, on, on COVID deaths. Um, here, what we're looking at is how many more people have died uh, since the pandemic began than you would have expected given their recent histories of mortality uh, in a particular country. And when you use those estimates, you find worldwide the pandemic has probably led to something like 18 to 20 million excess deaths, which is really striking. Um, the U.S. Um, did not have a great record. Um, uh, in 2020, a bit worse than average uh, when you use this measure among a reasonably prosperous countries, Latin America, uh, North America, um, Europe, um, uh, worse, significantly worse than Asia. Um, but then the U.S. 
does much worse than average in 2021. I don't think most people realize this. And this is largely due to the fact that other countries have been much more successful in getting people to get vaccinated and even more so getting people to get boosted. Right? The US um, has basically um, failed in comparative perspective to get people to get fully vaccinated and, and to get their booster shots. Their booster performance is really terrible. Um, and if the US has had Germany's record over the last year and a half or so, there would have been something like 600,000 fewer excess deaths in the US. Um, so even though the US was at the scientific forefront in terms of developing the vaccine, that's a place where the mixed economy helped to create a very successful um, pharmaceutical industry, um, it has been very, very bad in getting shots into people's arms. Um, so not an impressive record. Um, I don't wanna go on too much longer. I actually can't see a clock at the moment, so I'm not quite sure how long I've spoken, but I want I want to wind up pretty quickly. So I'm gonna just say a little bit about the politics, but I'll be happy to discuss this with people if they, if they want to. Um, uh, Americans don't like to rely on government anymore. Um, that's a form, form of amnesia. Uh, trust in government has declined. It's declined for a lot of reasons, but two that uh, we focus on in our book um, that, um, that I think are really important. It's not, it's not just that trust is changing at the individual level. It's that powerful forces in American society and American politics have really turned against uh, government. And the two that we highlight in the book, well, first of all, I just remember a quote, that, what Jacob likes to say about this. If you have amnesia, at least in the movies, if you have amnesia, it's usually because somebody hit you on the head, right? And so if people have forgotten what made America prosper, uh, it's, it's probably, and we provide a lot of evidence for this in the book, because there are people who have really been pushing that message. And the two places where you see that, the two organized places where you see that, are in um, the Republican Party and the business community. That's where the big change has taken place. Um, let me talk first just a little bit about the Republican Party. Here you see some of the big contributions to prosperity uh, that have come um, from government uh, in, the, in the 20th century, really in the 20th century since World War II. Um, and Republican presidents were involved in all of these things. And so here's Ike who was involved with all of this. Richard Nixon was very busy on domestic policy. He looked like a, I don't know, a liberal Democrat on a lot by, by American standard, by contemporary American standards, right? Uh, the Clean Air, signed the Clean Air Act, massive expansion of social security, massive expansion of higher ed, minimum wage increase, that ban on cigarette advertising he signed, Water Quality Improvement Act, Amtrak. Wow, all of that happening when Richard Nixon was president. Gerald Ford also did a bunch of this. The Americans with Disabilities Act is coming in here. Oh, that's gonna be, sorry, that's gonna be George Herbert, Herbert Walker Bush. Um, Republicans involved in lots of these initiatives uh, to, to bolster the mixed economy. And in the book, we have a, a little discussion of um, the Romney family, uh, most of you probably will remember. On the left, George Romney uh, was uh, governor of Michigan and a prominent uh, presidential candidate in 1968, lost out to, to Richard Nixon, but was to the left of Richard Nixon on uh, economic and social issues and had quotes like this, right? He's a Republican, a rugged individualism is nothing but a political banner to cover up greed. Dogmatic ideological parties tend to splinter the political and social fabric of a nation, lead to governmental crises and deadlocks and stymie the compromises so often necessary to preserve freedom and achieve uh, progress. Uh, but if you fast forward uh, to a second Romney a generation later, um, even though Romney, I suppose in the contemporary Republican party is closer to being a moderate, but he's far, far more conservative and anti-government uh, than his father was. His famous uh, quote from the 2012 campaign where he talked about the 47% who are dependent upon government, who believe that they're victims, who believe the government has a responsibility to care for them, 
who believe they're entitled to health care, to food, to housing, to you name it. And then he follows it up because a student asked him at a talk, and I, th I think the speech was in Michigan, if I remember right. It was in the Midwest. And a student asked him what he was going to do to make college more affordable. And Romney said, playing to his crowd, it would be popular for me to stand up and say, I'm going to give you government money to pay for your college, but I'm not going to promise that. And don't expect the government to forgive the debt that you take on. Essentially, he was saying, quite contrary to the views of people like Thomas Jefferson or Abraham Lincoln, also um, a Republican, the party of Lincoln, um, that you're on your own, right? That the, the nation as a whole has no interest in whether you can afford to go to college or not. And that's a dramatic change that the Republican party has gone undergone, which we have explored not just in this book, but our other books as well. And you can see these are measures of the conservatism of the average member of the Republican delegation in Congress um, from the mid 1970s when they were not that far away from the center and not that far away from Democrats um, to being way over on the right. Uh, and they've actually moved further on the right um, uh, since um, uh, the date of this in, in this slide. Um, the second big change is the business community. Uh, here's Paul Hoffman, who is the CEO of Studebaker and head of the Committee on Economic Development, which was an influential group, including many business leaders, um, who recognized um, that government uh, was the way in which we worked to protect and strengthen our natural resources, human and material, to lift up the standards of health, education, and welfare for ourselves and our children, uh, to mitigate individual and misfortune, and to execute projects not appropriate to, public, to private action. Right. So that's uh, the business community was not all uh, uh, enamored with the, the mixed economy. And of course, um, uh, uh, Mitt Romney's father, George, also came out of the private sector, right? He'd been the CEO of American Motors. Um, not all business leaders had these kinds of views of uh, support for the mixed economy, but it was very, very common in the 1950s and 1960s and 1970s. Uh, now, not so much. And we in addition to the Koch brothers, we talk about uh, the now retired uh, head of the Chamber, US Chamber of Commerce, Tom Donahue, um, who, who um, basically changed the, and gr greatly increased the power of the US Chamber of Commerce and turned it into a very different kind of organization. His little sign on his desk there says, show me the money. Um, if you wanted the chamber to help you with somebody, you needed to contribute big, which meant that most of the money was gonna come um, from the biggest uh, American corporations, uh, but he basically uh, turned the chamber into an organization that represents uh, what we call the modern robber barons uh, who finance American political campaigns now, huge shift in where campaign funding comes from over the last uh, 30, 40 years is coming overwhelmingly from, from very, very wealthy people. And, and this is a picture of uh, the Rhine where the old robber barons hang, hung out, what they used to do was they used to um, stretch a, a iron chain across the Rhine and basically tell people, you need to hand us money if you wanna to try to move your goods um, down the Rhine. Um, that's what being a robber baron was all about. You know, and much of the American economy now, healthcare, pharmaceuticals are good examples of this, has that kind of quality and the chamber has helped to support. Uh, that kind of quality by um, lobbying effectively for those groups to block action on climate change, which the fossil fuel industry doesn't like, uh, to block efforts to kind of try to control healthcare costs, uh, which the pharmaceutical industry doesn't like, and um, uh, much of the medical industry doesn't like as well, and so on. Um, how much hope is there that the politics around this will change, that we can get back uh, to remembering uh, what made America prosper. Again, this is something we can talk about more. I want, I want to wrap up. Um, but just, I, but I would say, I, and I think it's striking, Jacob and I are doing work on this now, um, that even though many um, are, are focusing now on gridlock in Congress, and that's a real thing to focus on, um, uh, with a sharply divided, polarized legislature and with a filibuster in the Senate, um, there was a dog that almost barked um, in, uh, in the past year. 
Um, the Biden agenda was um, remarkably, had remarkable echoes of this uh, early, earlier period of trying to bolster the mixed economy with huge investments in physical infrastructure, uh, including things like mass transit and the energy grid, um, in human infrastructure through, through education, research and development, um, the care infrastructure, taking care uh, of kids, trying to reduce poverty and uh, creating circumstances where kids have a better chance to grow and to live, to deal with um, a climate change. Um, very ambitious agenda on all these points. Um, but as we all know, um, there are only 48 votes in the Senate uh, for most of these proposals, and 48 is less than 50 if you do the math. So, uh, so very little of this has happened. Some of it did, but, but uh, much less than, than was um, anticipated by the administration. But I do want to underscore, and we can talk about this more, um, that this, it, it is a really striking change in American politics that such an ambitious domestic agenda could actually garner 48 point votes in the US uh, Senate, as well as passing, passing the House. Uh, and even though this, the Senate is quite skewed against, you know, it represents more rural, overrepresents rural states and so on, the Senate is a really tough playing field for this legislation. But I think it's worth recognizing that this is a big development in American politics that you can get 48 votes uh, for some such ambitious uh, domestic legislation. But it's not clear to me, um, uh, given the nature of our political institutions and um, uh, the, way, uh, the, the way our politics operates at the moment, that you could restore and update the mixed economy without support from the GOP, without more support um, from the business community. And I think that remains a very, very steep mountain to climb. Um, it's hard to imagine that kind of change in the Republican Party in the short term. There's tremendous resistance to having government play this kind of role. And in the past, the business community has been more likely to support these kinds of initiatives when there's been significant popular mobilization um, uh, that essentially pushes the business community to be willing to compromise around these kinds of issues. And that was really the story, the main story between the 1930s and the 1970s that we chronicle in our book. So uh, you're going to need to generate that kind of political pressure again if you're going to see um, the, kind, the kind of uh, policy changes, I think, at least at the national level, uh, that would reinvigorate our mixed economy. Um, okay, the, I'm just going to close by noting that when I was giving um, talks about this book back, um, back when it was published in, in 2016, I was able to note that there, there were lots of anniversaries um, that I could highlight in, in talks. Um, 2016, I was talking with a group of young political leaders in Berkeley, and I was able to note for them that it was the 60th anniversary of the Interstate Highway Act um, that had been signed by, um, by Dwight D. Eisenhower. Um, and three months later, I was able to note that we were celebrating the 100th anniversary of the National Park Service. Right? So there was a time in, a, in the US and American history when we didn't suffer from this kind of, kind of um, amnesia. And um, I think I've tried to make a case for you and I'm interested in exploring this and talking with you all um, about what we could do uh, to reinstate um, that kind of understanding of what can make America prosper, not just for those at the very top of the income distribution, uh, but for all of us. And I'll, I'll stop at, at this point. Thank you. Okay. Um, Brooke, do you want me to just go ahead and field these questions from the chat? I'm not sure where Brooke is. Okay, I'm just I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and start since I see one um, in the chat, and, and people can can add additional questions in the chat. Yeah. Okay, Paul. Yeah. Or you guys We've can. Got, uh, I've got two in the chat, and if you don't mind, I can read them to you. Okay, that's great. Then everybody will hear. Them. 
Uh, so the first one here is from Carl. And the question is, why has the 3P public-private partnership not taken off in the US today, lobbying in Congress? So, um, so you know, I tried to uh, sketch out quickly because I didn't want to go on. I, I wanted to make sure that we had some time to chat about this stuff. But I, you know, I sketched out what I, to me would be the core of the answer to that in um, uh, in the last few minutes of the talk. I mean, the two the two big things that that Jacob and I emphasize are um, the changing position of the Republican Party on these issues and the changing position of the business community on these issues. And you know, both of which have moved away from the idea of wanting government to play, this kind of, uh, to play a kind of robust partnership role. Uh, and I think that is in, in significant part about lobbying. And, you, and so you could point to another factor that's involved with this as well, the growth of inequality in the US over the last, uh, 40 years or so, which was the subject of our, our prior book, Winner Take All Politics, the U.S. Is really stands out as a country where inequality has grown dramatically. There's been a little bit of a growth in inequality um, in other affluent countries, but really nothing like what's been experienced in the U.S. with this massively increased share of the top 1% in the income distribution. And with that shift in in economic power has come a shift in the balance of political power as well. It's affected both political parties. It's made you know, the Democratic Party, I think, more answerable to powerful business interests as well, though that seems to have changed a little bit. I think it's moving back a little bit in the, in the last few years, and you can see that in the Biden agenda. Um, but, uh, but those are the big changes that I see as being really central to this, um, is um, you know, the, the changing changing stance of the Republican Party on these issues, its unwillingness to be involved in these kinds, kinds of efforts, which were bipartisan in an earlier era, uh, and um, the, also the turning of the business community away from these kinds of initiatives combined with its growing power, its ability to lobby Congress. Thanks, Paul. We'll see if uh, the person who asked the question might have a follow-up. Uh, the other one online is, are we ever going to have a strong three-party political system? If so, will it cure our problems? Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's a, gr that's a great question. Um, uh, in general, I think, I, you know, I, I think we need to be careful about thinking that there are magic bullet solutions out there. I think it's, um, it's easy to hope you know, it's, it's like the easiest thing is to hope that you can find one thing. And if you can do that one thing, you can fix everything. But as we chronicle in the book, it really took, um, you know, it was, probably, it was probably a 40 year struggle in the first half of the 20th century to cement the ideas of the mixed economy in American politics, right? You have to, you know, the progressive era in the early 1900s did some really important things, but probably I think it'd be fair to say suffered more political defeats than victories. But in many ways, it set the stage for for much that was to come later, um, which which came you know really grew out of the Great Depression and the New Deal, and also World War II. I think played a really important role in changing Americans' attitudes and the business community's attitudes towards towards the federal government and, and the role that it might the constructive role that it might play in, in our economy. So I think, you know, it took a lot of things feeding on, e on each other, a kind of series of virtuous cycles that moved the country and moved political elites in the direction of um, envisioning a mixed economy. And of course, this thing was the same thing was happening in a lot of other countries uh, in somewhat different ways as well. So I don't think there's a single magic bullet. Um, I do think our two-party system in its current highly polarized form right, is a huge obstacle, um, especially when it's combined with the filibuster um, with, and with a couple of very powerful advantages that Republicans now get from our uh, political institutions, which is that they, um, they often are in a very strong position in the US Senate because it overrepresents uh, rural areas. Um, and they now, of course, have a very strong position on the Supreme Court, um, in part because uh, 
um, because of that Senate overrepresentation um, and the Electoral College as well, which is, um, you know, if you think about it, if the electoral, you know, Donald Trump lost the popular vote in 2016, but the Electoral College gave him the presidency and then he was able to appoint three Supreme Court justices in four years, right? And so, you know, that's, that's a huge effect. So, so a two-party system that is polarized um, and that has these particular institutional advantages uh, for forces who are kind of hostile to the, to the mixed economy, that's a big obstacle. So if you could change it, um, you know, I think that would make a significant difference. Um, as I say to my student, I teach the big inter-American politics class at Berkeley, and as I say to my students, um, there's a reason why we've had the same two political parties uh, for, you know, for 150 years, um, even though the parties themselves have changed a lot, right? I mean, the, the Republican Party in the 19th, late 19th century was the, you know, the party of greater racial tolerance. Right? and the party that was more supportive of having an active federal government. So, so the parties changed, the names have stayed the same, and we've always had two of them. And um, you know, most political scientists think our constitution is hardwired to have two political parties, um, at least the way that we, because we have these elections, including elections for the presidency, where you don't get any payoff for finishing second, right? If you it's, you know, they're called first past the post systems, right? Whoever gets the most votes wins, right? Um, and so finishing second doesn't do anything for you. Most other countries do not have systems like that. They have some kind of proportional representation. So a third party can, you know, potentially elect a, a lot of people and potentially hold, hold the balance of power in a multi-party system. And I do think American politics would look very different if we had a multi-party system. But it is very hard to imagine how you get from here to there, right? How you would, you know, among other things, the founders made it very, very hard to change the constitution, right? So I think you can think about things that would make a difference at the margins. Um, you know, I think having um, a system, systems that have, um, you know, multiple round voting where it, if you're uh, first place candidate, you rank, rank choice voting, right? Where you rank all the candidates, that can have an effect um, on encouraging more moderate candidates there, but they're probably still gonna be within a two party system. And, you know, we're about to see an example of that, I think in Alaska where Lisa Murkowski, Republican is running for reelection. Donald Trump hates her, right? And many Republicans who are Trump supporters hate her right? Uh, at this point, she voted to remove Donald Trump from office. Um, but I think there's a very good chance that she will survive because Alaska has introduced ranked choice voting, right? So there are a lot of voters for whom she may not be their first choice, but they'd rather have her than have some, you know, the person they dislike more, right? So she, I think there's a good chance that she will win she would not be able to survive in a Republican primary, but she has a decent chance of surviving with ranked choice of voting. So that's a political reform that I think you can imagine uh, that, would, that would help, I think, in American politics. I think there are ways potentially to, um, to essentially unwind the Electoral College. We could talk about that if people are interested. That's another reform that I think would make a difference. But I don't think we're going to get to like a multi-party proportional representation kind of system. Unless we rewrite well, the Constitution. Sorry, go ahead. I have a question um, from what you were just discussing. And um, because right now I can't quite know, is, um, is ranked choice voting probably a state issue? And could states make that change? Yeah, it's a state, it is a state issue. They can. Um, states have a lot of discretion about, um, about how they set up their election rules. Um, you, you know, another thing you could do at the state level, which might get you closer to a multi-party system, is you could have what are called multi-member districts, right, where, which many, what many countries have, right, so, so the U.S., we, we have, everywhere we have single-member districts for, for the House, right, so, um, and those are winner-take-all, whoever gets the most votes wins, 
right? And, um, and it's gonna be the one of the two candidates who win the primary typically, right? But there's nothing in the constitution that says that California couldn't have everybody be an at-large representative, right? 45 or however many seats we have, or you know, divide the state into five districts, each of which choose nine representatives, right? Uh, and if you did that, and, and there are countries that do that, um, and that creates an opportunity where, okay, so if, you, if your party got 25% of the vote, then maybe you would get two of those nine seats, right? So that's, there's nothing in the constitution that would prohibit you from doing that. But I think to most American ears, that sounds really strange. Right. Um, I think Americans um, strong, are strongly inclined to believe that single member districts bring government closer to the people. Right. And that that's good. Right. Um, so that's the best system of representation. Um, but I, you know, that's I actually think there are a lot of good reasons to question that, particularly in a world in which we do have such tribal and polarized parties. You know, I agree with uh, what Carmelita was asking about that that generating um, a wider range of, um, of, of party organizations with different views would probably be quite healthy for our politics now. I don't really, you know, I don't think that close to 50% of Americans think that Donald Trump should be running the country, should be president. Um, but in a context where the parties are sharply divided and tribal, and then it's a two person race, between him and say Hillary Clinton, you know, he can potentially win that race. Um, and I think in a multi-party system, you would have a lot of, there would be a lot of Trump supporters, but I don't think it would be a majority. Thanks. Okay, I have another, oh, we have a question here live and then I'll go to the, the uh, other question here um, online. Okay, okay, and then if, if that does, if the mic doesn't work, so you can come up here. So, uh, all right, so uh, the question is, um, okay, there are two here. So since you bring up magic bullets to fix our political system, um, do you think that getting money out of politics would be enormously helpful? Politicians' dependency on donors seems to skew their priorities. Yes, I do think that that would be extremely helpful. Um, and I, I, I moved through it pretty quickly, Adam, so I don't know if people had time to fully absorb that slide, the slide about campaign finance. Um, but in, in 19, around 1980, between 10 and 15% of the money in federal elections came from the top 10th of 1% of the income distribution. That's, you know, that's pretty skewed. Right. Um, but by 2016, it was about 50% of the money in federal elections was coming from just the top 10th of 1%. Right. Um, and that doesn't even get you to dark money. It doesn't get you to lob lobbying money, which is similarly skewed. Um, so I, you know, there, there's some controversy about this among political scientists, but Jacob and I are very much on the side uh, that money in politics is a huge problem. Um, but here, and you know, and, and particularly a problem for uh, a politics like the politics that we're describing in which um, you try to use government to do things that are gonna benefit everybody in, in the society um, and they're gonna, gonna use tax money to do that. Um, so, but of course, this is also, especially with our current Supreme Court, um, a very steep hill to climb. You know, I, I find myself increasingly seeing, you know, for years I've thought of the Senate as being the biggest obstacle within American political institutions to a mixed economy. But I think at this point, you've got, the Senate has got to move over um, and see that, that um, poll position to, uh, to the Supreme Court. Um, you know, the Supreme Court is not going to allow this, this Supreme Court is not going to allow any serious campaign finance regulation. Uh, and I mean, even, even the Supreme Court of 
15 or 20 years ago wasn't willing to do that. Um, it was already a pretty conservative Supreme Court, but this Supreme Court clearly is not going to allow allow you to do that. Um, at the same time, they're likely to go after important elements of the existing mixed economy, like the Environmental Protection Agency. I think you know everybody's eyes are focused, understandably, on what's going to happen to Roe v. Wade, but I think it is extremely likely that in the next few months we're going to get a decision on environmental regulation that is going to be somewhere bef between deeply damaging and catastrophic for the Environmental Protection Agency. Hey, <laughs> that's a powerful. Um, Sorry. Uh, let's go to your question, then I have another one here online. All right, I'll read this one. Um, hopefully our younger citizens will have a more open-minded look at the future of our government and might, and might be willing to make some changes. So you are constantly in front of our younger citizens. Um, how much do you think that they will become more involved, more open-minded about the government's role? Uh, it's, a great, it's a great question. Um, and I think here, um, it's, I think it's a kind of good news, bad news story. Um, I, think the, I think the good news is um, that I, th I do think students are more open-minded about these kinds, kinds of questions. Um, I think, I mean, you ask, you know, certainly things like climate change, they really care about. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, I think many of the things that were in my slides about constructive roles that government can play would re re resonate with younger voters. And I think that that's both my experience in teaching and, and also um, I think it's supported by the public opinion research that I've, that I've seen. Um, the bad news is that I think a lot of young people are very demoralized about the political system, very demoralized. Um, and um, for, for reasons that I think are quite understandable, I didn't really go into it in the talk, but. But you know, when you see that what's happened to trust, you know, part of the problem is there's a kind of downward spiral, right? In which um, there are attacks on government, its capacity is drained, uh, and then it doesn't perform particularly well. And so that generates in increased disillusionment. And you can see this with the Biden administration. I mean, the, the group that is, mo you know, so, so Biden is obviously hurting at the polls now. Um, but the, the group where he has lost the most ground in terms of their approval is young people. Um, and um, I, th you know, I think that is mostly feeling, you know, is, is disappointment. They feel like um, there's a crisis, that there are things that really need to be done. And that when President Biden ran for election, he promised that there would be, you know, that there would be ambitious action on these things. And on the whole, it hasn't happened, right? So, and you could say, I'm, I, I'm one of those who think that has a lot more to do with the math of the Senate than it has to do with um, uh, the decisions that Joe Biden has or hasn't made. I don't really, it's easy to play Monday morning quarterback and I don't particularly find very persuasive arguments people make if, if he'd only done this or if he'd only done that, he would have gotten Joe Manchin's vote. I don't, I don't believe that. I, and I've done a fair amount of interview work in, in Washington that makes, reinforces my views that that's not the case. Um, but, um, you know, but most, most citizens, most young people are not following these things on, on such a day-to-day -day level that they're going to, that they're going to come to a conclusion that we just have to redouble our, we're on the right track and we need, we need 52 seats instead of 48 seats or, you know, it's not his fault. It, it, they're just, they just see that it's not happening. Um, and of course, you know, he's also not the most, I imagine not the most charismatic fellow for, um, for people under 60, <laughs> uh, for our people under, you know, certainly for people under 30. Right, right. <laughs> Okay, okay I think, Sue, I think we've got a mic that works for you back there. 
Okay, all right, how's that? Um, I just wondered if you could um, address uh, voter suppression efforts in state legislatures and, you know. <laughs> yeah, what? yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, gosh, what it wants. So I, I think uh, voter su suppression and Making it making the point more broadly, I, I would say sort of anti democracy efforts, um, both in the state level and at, and at the federal level, um, are huge problems in the U.S. Um, now, I mean, I mean, you know, five alarm fire uh, problems in the U.S. It is it is quite striking. I mean, it wasn't really the subject of this talk. It's something that I've written about and worked on a lot in other. Context or the most recent book that Jacob and I wrote is called "Let Them Eat Tweets: um, How the Right Rules in an Age of Extreme Inequality," and it talks a lot about um, what political scientists call democratic backsliding, um, and how there's a certain logic to the progression of the Republican Party and its most powerful supporters over the last 30 years that can actually lead in the direction of um, yeah, a voter suppression of, um, of you know, supporting what I think if you were looking at it happen in another country, you would have to, you would have to identify as an attempted coup uh, in, on January 6th. You know, the efforts around January 6th were an attempted coup. Um, I, think, I think the evidence on that, if you look at what various people were up to, that's clear. And the person who, was trying to engineer that attempted coup is likely to be the Republican nominee for president in 2024 if he chooses to run. So, I mean, I know that sounds really partisan to say that. Um, and I'm sure a lot of what I'm saying sounds really partisan. I, 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 I try in this context not to think about this in partisan terms, but again, like if I were, if I were studying Hungary or um, the Czech Republic or Chile, and I was watching these kinds of events and the way in which one of the two major political parties responded to those events, I would say that that's democratic backsliding. And the political scientists who do study this comparatively are now extremely worried about, about American democracy. And as, as the questioner is saying, a lot of this is happening at the state level. Right? Um, and, we, and, and given the way American politics is organized, we were talking about multi-member districts before, states have a lot of discretion, probably especially with this Supreme Court and how they choose to run those local elections. Um, and so you know, the idea that the state legislature could just, and these state legislatures are terribly filibustered. As, I mean, uh, sorry, gerrymandered, as you know. Um, uh, in Mich you know, Michigan's an example of that. Uh, Wisconsin's an example of that. But you could you could imagine the Supreme Court saying that it was okay for the state legislature to simply declare that their favorite candidate was the winner of the election. Um, you know that that would have been unthinkable twenty years ago. Well, you got Bush v. Gore. You could talk about Bush v. Gore, I suppose. I your answers are, are, are fascinating. Yeah. And I have another question from yeah. someone. Um, and so we'll just take a couple more minutes um, of your time, if we may. Uh, and the, the, the question is, it's, it's listening to you. Um, the, it's Carmelita again asks, but won't Trump have to admit he lost in 2020 if he chooses to run in 2024, since he cannot serve three terms? That's really, that's very clever. I, had not, I hadn't heard that um, before, uh, that, um, that idea. Um, I don't think, I mean, of course, he could admit it one day and then go back to denying it the next day. But, you know, the number of terms that Donald Trump has served is not dependent on whether Donald Trump currently thinks he's president of the United States or not. He served one term. Right. I mean, he's not president of the United States. It doesn't really matter whether he thinks he is or not. Um, and, you know, I, I actually don't know whether he thinks that he won the election. I'm totally he He may well have convinced himself that he did. Um, you know, I don't think it mattered. I don't, I don't think his behavior would be any different if he thought that he lost. Um, 
but um, it doesn't matter in terms of the, in terms of constitutionality. It doesn't matter how many whether he thinks he's president now or not. All right. Um, someone has said it's currently it is. Thanks for your expertise. I have learned a lot tonight. I think that we all have. Um, and thank you very much, Paul, uh, for being our guest tonight. I do want to read a final um, uh, paragraph of writing by E.B. White, which sort of um, this too has tried to be um, uh, what, what clear thinking as a series um, and not put politically on one side or the other, but trying to find, um, find the truth. <laughs> um, this is from um, E.B. White. It was, it's, it's included in the book of How Democracies Die by Stephen Lubitsky and Daniel Zidlat. Um, and they write, they introduce it with this um, setup. When the US was in its darkest days during World War II, the US federal government's writers war board asked E.B. White to write a short response to the question, what is democracy? E.B. White wrote, surely the board knows what democracy is. It is the line that forms on the right. It is the don't in don't shove. It is the hole in the stuffed shirt through which saw, the sawdust slowly trickles. It is the dent in the high hat. Democracy is the recurrent suspicion that more than half of the people are right more than half of the time. It is the feeling of privacy in the voting booths, the feeling of communion in the libraries, the feeling of vitality everywhere. Democracy is a letter to the editor. Democracy is a score at the beginning of the ninth. It is an idea which hasn't been disproved yet, a song, the words of which have not gone bad. It's the mustard on the hot dog and the cream in the rationed coffee. Democracy is a request from a war board in the middle of a morning, in the middle of a war, wanting to know what democracy is. Thank you all very much who have been part of this series and have a good democratic life, small d. Good night. Thanks again, Paul. Thank you.